It is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. John Newman absolutely needs no introduction to this crowd. Most of you have read his excellent book, JFK and Vietnam, and we're about to get another book by John that is even more pertinent to our interest here. And I know of no researcher who has done more important work than John Newman, and he is doing, continuing to do the same good work. I've been privileged to work with him in a small way for over a year, and I'm constantly amazed by his mind and the way he can analyze documents and and give us the meaning of things that were very esoteric to us before. John, it's my pleasure to introduce you. Thank you, Mary. I don't hold a candle to one thousandth of the work or the contribution you've made to the case and to probably just about everybody in this room. Mary Farrell is somebody you can always call and ask for something. You know you're going to get the best that, that she can give you. And I am very, very much indebted to you, Mary Farrell, for all that you've done. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. This is really what I came to talk to you about. Um, it's a, always a pleasure to come to ask um, and to so try, I try and support what you do down here. Um, it's a bit difficult for me to do this because I am in the middle of an investigation. On the other hand, you are the reason, we all are the reason together that this, we're here, that, that there is progress in the case, so at least in, in my heart and my mind, I'm always conscious of the need to, to share and to get things out as, as rapidly as possible. If I am somewhat defensive, it's not because I'm, I want to be, it's because there are some very sensitive interviews going on and, and in fact, um, we may be into some um, extraordinary situations with uh, people who are still alive where the review board may actually have to use as extraordinary powers. So um, having said that, I, um, I've covered myself, right? I can sneak, <laughs> I can sneak out of anything now if I want. Um, much like JFK in Vietnam, um, I didn't understand when I started the Oswald research that um, I would be looking at some of the things I was as fast as I was and uh, so it takes on a, a life of its own um, but you get involved in, in it to the point where you can't really control it so uh, what I'm going to talk to you about tonight I really believe that we're really getting inside this case I don't know what the answers are I really don't but I believe for the first time, uh, because we have this, this new material, that we're beginning to get to the point where we can um, get some answers. And um, tonight I'll give you my, my thesis. I call this presentation The Smoking File. Um, Lee Oswald, uh, an ex-Marine who had served at several bases where he learned the details of the CIA's most sensitive technical spy mission, the U-2. Walked into the American Embassy in Moscow in October 1959, the enemy capital, at the height of the Cold War and brazenly announced his intention to give up American military secrets. We're led to believe, apparently, nobody in the intelligence community was listening. Nobody cared. Five months later, the Soviet, Soviet air defenses shot down a U-2 piloted by Francis Gary Powers. In October 1963, exactly four years later, 
Lee Harvey Oswald walked into the Cuban embassy, excuse me, the Cuban consulate in Mexico City, a nerve center for the CIA's most sensitive penetration operations against Cuban intelligence. At a very propitious moment, when our anti-Castro plots were cresting to their ultimate failure, as it turned out, the FBI tells us, this Clarence Kelly, director of the FBI, tells us he's certain that Oswald brazenly offered information on plots against Castro and brazenly threatened to kill President Kennedy. Of this, he was absolutely sure. Three months later, John Kennedy was murdered. It's an interesting pattern here. Our fellow Lee Harvey Oswald seems to have developed a habit of walking into consulates and embassies and making all sorts of threats, and no one seems to listen. And then within a few months afterwards, Powers is shot down, Kennedy is shot. Could it be that like Oswald's threats at the American Embassy in Moscow that the CIA knew all along and took no action? Thirty years later, this part of the CIA's files about Oswald are still classified. What the CIA knew of Oswald's Cuban escapades is an extraordinary story, which lies, I believe, at the very heart of this case. Deception and lies have interred the agency's knowledge of Oswald's Russian and Cuban activities in an impregnable tomb. For 30 years, researchers have been looking for a key to unlock the, the assassination case. I believe now we have one such key. The CIA's knowledge of Lee Harvey Oswald's Cuban operations, and in particular, his activities in the Cuban consulate in Mexico City in the summer of 1963. An old saying has it that the best place to hide something is sometimes right out in the open. When the Kennedy assassination made public disclosure of Oswald's Russian and Cuban activities unavoidable, the veil was thrown around the agency's pre-assassination knowledge of certain aspects of these activities. So thus, while we could see what Oswald was doing, we couldn't see what the agency knew about it. In the 30 years since, many secrets have surfaced, but now we have a most intriguing one, and that is that the agency's anti-Cuban operations included a deception involving the alleged assassin of the president. The newly released JFK files make it possible now to isolate the fact that the CIA is hiding what it knew about Oswald and has lied to us systematically for 30 years about it. Moreover, the sheer quantity of new documents makes it impossible to prevent details from slipping through the cracks. These details prove that the agency has been lying not only about what happened before the assassination, but about what they knew and what they did with respect to Oswald after the assassination. I must tell you up front right now that I haven't found an institutional plot in the CIA to murder Kennedy. Such a plot may have existed. So when I say this, doesn't mean one way or another that I have an opinion. I'm just telling you, looking at all these files, there is not easy evidence that could easily be interpreted as some sort of large institutional plot. However, the pieces that I'm going to show you may well fit into other scenarios, such as a renegade faction or bad apple hypothesis. If Mr. Morrissey is listening, um, he has posted on internet that uh, when, I make, when I say to you this sentence that means that I advocate this theory, I don't. What I am saying is that the pieces we're looking at arguably are consistent with 
such hypotheses. It doesn't make them true. You see, I don't think it's prudent really to guess anymore why the CI is still holding back information. So what I want to do is work with the review board to get all the files before we, we leap into any interpretation. On the other hand, I think we can finally say with some authority that the CIA was in fact spawning a web of deception about Oswald weeks before Kennedy's murder. A fact which, without regard to conspiracies or anti-conspiracies in Dealey Plaza, directly contributes to the outcome in Dallas, one way or the other. The other piece that fits into that concerns the Kostikoff story, Kostikoff being a Department 13 KGB officer of that's assassinations, a person with whom Oswald is alleged to have spoken in Mexico City. And I don't have time to go into that during the formal part of the presentation, but if there is interest in it, I have some ideas and we can maybe address that in the Q&A. Without any further ado, looking at me speak is, is one thing, but I would prefer that we take a look at some of these new files. So Frank, if you could turn the lights down for us. Actually, this is a, uh, can I, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me audio in the back? No, I'm doing We all right? I have a mic over here. Okay, I'll use this. Is that, this is, yeah. a, this is better? Okay. This, to me, is what's new in the files. There are many other things besides this, but what you're looking at is actually, and this is one example, I don't intend to talk about this one in particular, but what you are looking at here is a uh, CIA standard record and routing sheet of Form 610A. And when a document comes into the agency, one of these things gets slapped on the front of it. And it comes into Records Integration Division. And um, then it is routed through the various elements in the agency. CI staff, Counterintelligence Special Investigations Group, that's the Angleton's Mole Hunting Unit, Counterintelligence Operations, Counterintelligence International Communist Group, Soviet Russia, Sixth Branch, that's Soviet Realities, Counter Espionage, Soviet Russia Division, Soviet Russia, uh, Russian Intelligence Service, Soviet Russia Division Propaganda, etc. Once you have a, you know, you read a, a couple of, you know, thousand of these things, you begin to figure out what these, uh, what these elements are. Over here are the initials of the people who actually read this file. This is an Oswald file, by the way. An FBI, probably was an FBI report. Yeah, 3 July 61. Uh, that would be a Fane, a Fane report. And then next to their name, we get to see, in most cases, a date stamp. The Warren Commission never saw most of the documents, period, that concern Oswald's CIA files. They, so, they saw nothing of the agency's anti-Cuban operations. And even the House Select Committee was not shown this type of document. They were shown what was behind these record sheets. They wanted to see these routing sheets. They were not allowed to see them. And you're going to see why. I call this really an, an, the internal audit trail. These sheets allow us to see who in the CIA was reading Oswald's files and when they were reading them. There's no column blacked out, sir. These are just portions blacked out. These would be um, more uh, element uh, identifiers of the particular elements. In some cases, they would be names. Um, this is not a problem. We can figure out every single one of these. Um, well, you can. No, it's, it's, it, I, I'm, I'm serious. Uh, it, it doesn't take too long. This is not rocket science. 
um, the, if, if we only had two or three of these things, we would have great difficulty. But anytime you get a great quantity of data, uh, just somebody of average intelligence using very minimal analytic techniques can, can fill in all these blanks. Anyway, I was trained to do that in the Army. Uh, initially with enemy communications, and I don't consider this enemy communications, but it, um, it certainly is interesting. Um, this, this information up here is, is very crucial to me. I'm going to show you later what I can do with this type of stuff up here, and up here, and down here. Um, when you have two or three thousand of these cables, even though they black a lot of that out, uh, it, it, it's possible to reconstruct, I think, the entire directorate of operations in the CIA. Anyway, I would like to uh, talk about uh, two or three things to you. I obviously cannot go on forever about too many things in one evening, so I'm going to focus on three things. I'd like to tell you about a deception, a lie, and an outrage. And this is the outrage. What we're looking at here is actually a uh, CIA cable that was sent from the JM Wave Station. I believe that's up here. Right there, you can see it. To the headquarters. And it's actually sent on the 22 November, 1963. About 22:42 Zulu. Subtract five hours and you'll get Eastern Standard Time. So we're talking about Oh, Air Force One is about an hour, hour and a half away from landing at Air, Andrews Air Force Base at, at this particular point. And um, what we have here is there um, a message here that's talking to us about a Cuban emigre delegate who had a radio debate with Lee Oswald and uh, Cuban emigre files uh, about Oswald. And the amazing thing to me, am I on your way, Al? <laughs> um, is this uh, paragraph two. It says, above information has not been passed to the Secret Service, the State Department, or the FBI, because this Cuban emigre organization wants to have their own press conference. That's what it says in English. Now, I underline here what's, what's happening. The President of the, in the United States has been murdered. His alleged assassin is in the custody of the authorities. And the CIA has information, has files on the alleged assassin. And they are not passing them to the FBI or the Secret Service so that our emigre organization can have a little propaganda coup. I think that's outrageous. I don't know what your views about it, but I find it outrageous. Now, that was an old document. This is what's new in the files. This is the same document, and you will see here that I have discovered a document where it's not blacked out, and in fact, that human emigre organization has an A. A.M. Spell. A.M. Spell. That's a cryptonym. All CIA cryptonyms, you know some A.M. cryptonyms, don't you? A.M. Lash. A.M. Whip. I have a few more I'm going to show you in a little bit. This one AM spell is the Cuban Student Directorate. Most of you who saw this cable before would have realized by now that the AM spell delegate who had the radio debate is Harlow Springer. Okay. So, AM spell. It's a very interesting um, cryptonym. And in fact, if you um, dig a little deeper, you will find that um, Am, Am Spell uh, received military training from the CIA and, in fact, um, were paid for. Uh, the Am Spell budget was part of the CIA budget. Yes, Carlos Springay's organization was a CIA organization, paid for by the CIA, trained by the CIA, with military branch and a propaganda branch. And here we're talking about, um, at, by this time, uh, there was still a AMSPEL. Actually, their military operations had to be moved outside of the continental U.S. after the Cuban Missile Crisis, pursuant to the Kennedy deal with Khrushchev. And what's happening 
here is they're moving their military operations into Costa Rica and other places, but their propaganda activities continue, and here they're identifying one individual who is still on the uh, Kubark, that would be CIA, uh, payroll, uh, is identity 12, and his name is actually uh, Salvat, S-A-L-V-A-T, and he is in Miami at this time. I just put this slide up, the teaching point from this is that AMSPEL was in fact a CIA operation. Hmm. I should have shown you this one, sorry, this is a little bit easier to see from the back. Uh, and then this is just to remind you that this CIA organization in fact had files. What This is the original one I showed you, that what we have here of course is is uh, AM spell files, not human emigre files, AM spell files on Oswald are being withheld from the Secret Service and the FBI. Now I want to talk to you about a lie. This document here is, um, you can see the date, um, is a CIA communication to the Warren Commission um, and it discusses a number of things, but what I would like to focus you on very quickly is on page four. It's quite a lengthy um, cable, and I think I have a, uh, you can see I'm, I'm, I'm rather amazed by something in here, and I'll show you why. That means I'm amazed. <laughs> now, um, the lines that, that I'm amazed by it, are right here. This is, in fact, um, talking about Mr. Helms. Mr. Helms is telling uh, Lee Rankin this information that we're reading here. And back in 1964, Mr. Helms, then, of course, the deputy director for plans, um, is talking about why the Mexico City CIA station reported Oswald's visit there. And if you look very closely, it and it's talking about surveillance and, and when and why American citizens are reported, etc. But if you look at this sentence here, it says that in Oswald's case, it was the combination of visits to both the Cuban and Soviet. Cuban and Soviet. Cuban and Soviet. Cuban, is Cuban and Soviet embassies, which caused the Mexico City Station to report this to headquarters in the first place. Now, a little bit problematic since what we've been told all these years is that although the information relating to Oswald's contact by telephone with the Soviet Embassy in Mexico City on 1 October was reported to headquarters on the 8th in the famous 8 October cable, the information relating to several contacts Oswald had with the Cuban consulate, that should say consulate, did not surface until after the president's assassination. Now, wait a minute. Is this reverse? Yeah. I thought it said here. Didn't Helms just say, yeah, that's what he said. He said here that it was his presence at both locations that caused them to report it in the first place. Now, I have a doctrine called restraint. And what that means is we can't rely on just one document. I mean, it might be a mistake. What if this is a mistake? I use General McChristian's, um, he was Patton's G2 in World War II, and he had, he had a, a technique, he said, two documents and one POW, or two POWs and one document, and then it's valid, <laughs> all right? Well, that way, you know, the, the soldiers don't get killed on the battlefield, it's, it's reasonable, and we don't want to get killed in this, in this case anymore, do we? So, here we have another document, and of course, this means I'm amazed here, and um, here's what, what amazes me, and you can see here that it says that, uh, okay, we're talking about the uh, 16 October memorandum and so on, and then subsequently there were several, several Mexico City cables in October, October, 1963. See, Kennedy was assassinated in November, I believe. Um, <clears throat> and um, what did these cables in October concern? 
Oswald's visit to Mexico City, as well as his visits to the Soviet and Cuban embassies. Ah, two documents. Two documents. And I have my POW. Six weeks ago, uh, Director Helms, in a recorded interview on the record, confirmed this story and admitted that they lied about this to cover uh, their sources. So I have my two documents and my POW. <laughs> the agency lied about Oswald's visit. Excuse me. They lied about when they knew that he visited the Cuban consulate. The story we've been told is we didn't know that until after the shots rang out in Dealey Plaza. They knew immediately that our boy was in that consulate. It's very interesting. When the Mexico City CIA station reported Oswald's presence, of course, headquarters had to respond. Who was this masked man who walked around down there? Now, this here is the famous um, headquarters response. The date is 10 October, 1963. And um, what we have here is an entire page of just about everything Oswald did in Russia. Who he married, and the whole, you know, practically the whole story is in here. It's very interesting if, you, if the question was about his visit to Russia. Of course, he went to Russia in October 1959. How many years ago is that? Let's see. 1960, just like four years ago. They're talking about something going on four years ago. Page two, at, and we're still you know, talking all about the things he was doing way back in 1960 and so on, and then 61 married Marina and, and so on. Then this is a curious paragraph right here. Actually, I should have one of those great big things in the margin over here you know, that shows I'm amazed. The, it says here, and I need you to, to really lock and load on this sentence here. It says here that the latest headquarters information, headquarters, that means CIA headquarters, okay? This is from CIA headquarters to its Mexico City station. Now, let's take a look at this. Okay, our latest headquarters is a state report dated May 62. Okay, let's, let's, let's do a little math here. This is 10 October 1963. The latest CIA information on Lee Harvey Oswald is May 1962. Yeah, he's only been on television and radio and, you know, arrested and demanded an FBI uh, interview in the jail cell and, you know, the whole, you know the story. All of you know the story really well. God, can you imagine having a CIA that doesn't know what happened to this man in the previous 18 months? It's extraordinary. If it's true. <laughs> See, but that's the rub. It's not true. Oh, I did. There you go. That's right. Wrong slide. That means I'm amazed at that sentence there. And um, what's interesting about these files now is that we, we have some idea of, of who, um, who did this. So, for example, here we can see, um, well, they're hiding a few things, aren't they? You know, and why would they do this? This is J.C. King, chief of the Western Hemisphere Division. There is his name, but there's this black spot over it. What is this, signature style classified or something? <laughs> Actually, there's a reason why that's on there, because J.C. King doesn't sign there. I'll show you in a minute. Um, for some reason, I guess they don't want to protect Jane Roman, right? She must be dead. No, she's not. She's actually alive. Very strange. Uh, this would be Mr. Karmessines, who is um, the assistant deputy director for plans. This is an old cable. What's new in the files is this copy. And you can see that they forgot to um, black this part out here. This is William Hood signing off for J.C. King. William Hood was a deputy under J.C. King. Western Hemisphere Division, by the way, is one operations division among many in the Directorate of Plans, the dark side, the covert side of the CIA. Now we have some new names here. We have Mr. Stefan Rohl, who works in the analytic shop of the counterintelligence section of the Soviet Russia Division. And of course, we have, there's Jane Roman. Here we have Annie Edgeter. 
She was the one who opened Oswald's 201 file a year late in 1960. Anyway, um, she, here this is a special projects group, which is another way of saying special investigations group, which is Angleton's Mole Hunting Unit, CI SIG. That's where she works, and she's the one who's had Oswald's 201 file restricted for the previous two years. And then you can see we have a signature here that they don't, still don't want us to see. You know, I have three copies of the um, Lopez report, and I have about four copies of the IG report, and they're all redacted differently. And when you put them all together, you got to get a, you get a kind of a stereoscopic <laughs> vision. And um, found another one of these same cables, and bingo, John Celso signed off for Chief of Western Hemisphere 3. Uh, I know it's John Celso. I don't have the time to show you all the cables, but I'm going to show you my, uh, some of my work and how I figure that out later. Okay, so we know everybody who signed uh, off of this, for this draft. Now, the very same day the agency reported this to its Mexico City station, they also had to tell all of official Washington. Well, not all of official Washington, okay, I exaggerated, but they got to tell the Department of State, FBI, and the Navy, and so on, about this, this guy running around and down there. And um, essentially, we have the same message here. The problem is um, that there's one sentence missing. In paragraph three here, um, the date of latest information is May 62. It's gone. It's not there. So I said to myself, aha, this can't be a mistake, right? I mean, if it was a mistake, that sentence would be in both cables. But they put that sentence in the one they sent to the Mexico City station, but they didn't put it in the one that they sent on exactly the same day to the FBI. Good thing they didn't. I mean, they'd only been reading FBI reports for the previous 18 months. So how could they tell the FBI we haven't had anything from you for 18 months? It wouldn't make any sense. So they, they didn't put it in there. And then we have uh, the problem of saying, well, gee, maybe different people did it. Huh? Maybe different people saw this one than, than the other one. And of course, you have this problem with these dark spaces down here, so you can't figure it out. But, you know, we zip to another box in the archives, and there it is. And, um, they don't have the names here, but I think if you remember, we saw SRCI um, Roll earlier, and I think this is just about the right amount of space for Mr. Stephen Roll's last name. And that, of course, is the right uh, um, organization for him there. And there's Jane Roman again over here, CI liaison, and this would be any editor, CI SIG. So it's all the same people, in other words. Now, this would be the document they were talking about, the May 62 one, the latest information. Um, actually, the date of the report is late April, and it comes through in May 62, and it's, an, it's another FBI report. Um, and then this here um, is the cover sheet to a FBI report authored by a um, fellow Dallas person, uh, Mr. Husty, on um, what's the date of his document? 10 September 1963. Now, Mr. Hostie wrote a report about Lee Harvey Oswald on that date, on the 10th of September, and it entered the CIA on September 20, God, I can't read it now, 28th or 23rd at 1.24 p.m. And Annette in Records Integration Division sent it all over to Jane Roman. There's her signature on the 28th or so. There's her staff element, and then she sent it over to the operations element and counterintelligence, Mr. Will Pataki. And he said, well, I don't know who this guy is. I just know that it's international communism under counterintelligence, and so on. Of course, this would be a problem, wouldn't it, for latest information being May 62? That wouldn't really fit, would it? I mean, this is not May 62. It's September 63, right? So um, obviously, there's something wrong with that cable I showed you. This here is another cover sheet. This is, happens to be a cover sheet to another FBI document. This one's well known um, amongst researchers as the so-called letterhead memorandum. Letterhead memorandum from the FBI are rather special. 
they make sure they don't make mistakes, spelling mistakes. It, it has to be real nice because it's for external distribution. Letterhead memoranda are a little higher grade jobs than just normal internal memoranda. Anyway, it was a very special LHM because it has in it the entire story of Oswald's Cuban capers in New Orleans. You know, the arrest, the radio debates, the, 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 the fracas on the street with Bringay, the whole thing is in this report. And that report came into the agency um, on October the 2nd. Actually, you know, it's an interesting day because Oswald's leaving Mexico City at this particular point. And, and that sends it on over to Jane Roman again, and Jane Roman sends it to the special affairs staff, Mr. Horn, and then he sends it over to somebody whose initials are CR, also in special affairs staff, and then Ann Edgeter gets it in uh, CI SIG, and then eventually it winds its way back to Annette, and then on the way into a file which is not his 201. This is his 201 file here, 289248. This is entered later. This is the file that it was put into right here, 100-300-11. It's a special file. I believe that, that has, this number has to do with Cuban operations. But once again, um, looking at this, you would be amazed because, for example, um, Jane Roman is reading this Oswald report, this extraordinary one. I mean, the whole story of what he did in New Orleans is quite amazing if you've read it. And she's reading this on the 4th, and then, of course, on the 10th, signs off on this cable that says they didn't have anything on Oswald for 18 months as is everybody, including editor, and so on. Now, this is a little uh, chart I prepared. Um, I well, I took all the uh, principal 610 routing sheets of these documents coming in from Navy and FBI and State Department on Oswald, and then I just sort of plotted them out in, in the internal um, boxes here as to who saw these reports and when they saw them and where they worked. So it's a pretty neat um, graphic. And I'd blown up just a piece of it for you just to show you graphically here um, the reports. These, all these reports here under this sort of story one here, in other words, this one, this one, and this one fall in that 18-month missing period. These are how many people in the CIA read files about Oswald that they didn't have, okay? <laughs> it's very impressive. It's not one person who's having a brain cramp here. I mean, the entire agency is brain cramping if we were to believe that cable. Um, not the entire agency, okay, the Soviet Russia division, the counterintelligence staff, the special affairs staff, you know, a number of people anyway, a, a very wide array of, of people. And just to remind you, because uh, I may have been running on at the mouth too long there, that um, this is the sentence that I am amazed by. Latest headquarters info, state report dated May 62. Now, I don't know any way to explain what we're looking at here other than operational use of Oswald's files. That's what this is. You have to understand this is a deliberate act. All those people that signed off on this cable didn't wake up one morning on 10 October and say, hey, gee, let's go falsify a, an Oswald cable. That'll be fun. No, it's not the way, they don't do things like that. This deception, I don't call this a lie even. It's not a lie. This is not for external distribution. This is not for public dissemination. This is a secret cable to the CIA station in Mexico City. It's not a lie, but it's a deception. It's a conscious act to write a false story of what headquarters knew about Oswald. Now, we've been told they never used Oswald in any way. I'm sorry, this here is hard evidence that his file is being used in some sort of an operation that involves the Mexico City Station. Lights, lights on, please, just for a minute. 
From the moment that Lee Oswald returned from Russia in June 1962, his Cuban activities began. They continued right down to the day before he left for Mexico City in September 1963. The CIA knew about all of these activities, and thanks to these newly released files, we now know which CIA employees knew about and signed for access to the files about Oswald's Cuban capers. In October 1963, those very same people drafted a cable with a big whopping deception in it, explicitly, explicitly denying any knowledge of all of these activities. Why did the agency conduct this deception operation about its knowledge of Oswald? I think the public deserves an answer, but I'm not going to give it to you. And you know what? I'm real proud to say that because I don't want to. In fact, I think what we need to do now is, is completely change the psychology around here. It's not my job to guess what this operation is or, or why they're doing this. I mean, think about it. Since when do you get into a confrontation with somebody and this somebody has all the data and you don't and you have to guess? That's not fair. So for the time being, I don't know and I don't really care to guess. Obviously, it's got something to do with counterintelligence. We can see that. All the people that are on those Oswald Cuban Capers uh, documents are all in counterintelligence, or most of them are. But I don't find it useful to worry myself right now about it. Um, what, we, what we do know is that it, this takes place at a very uh, important time in the agency's anti-Cuban operations. I think from our standpoint, the real question is, or actually a series of questions. Let me put it to you this way. What does Oswald do? What are the agency's operations? And then, well, once we know both of those, do his actions have any relevance for those operations? That would be the order. That the question, those should be the questions in the order in which they should be asked. Six weeks ago, I showed these documents to former director of Central Intelligence, Richard Helms. Um, I'm happy to tell you that Mr. Helms did not lie to me and acknowledged, um, as I indicated a minute ago, that they did lie about uh, knowledge of Oswald's visit to the Cuban consulate. With respect to this part of the operation, in other words, the deception, the deceptive message, uh, Mr. Helms backed away and um, told me he didn't really wish to, to be revealing agency secrets. And I told him I understood that. But ultimately, I think um, they're going to have to tell us because that's what the law says they have to do. One might be tempted to rationalize this whole affair and in fact, people are, and I see it constantly, to rationalize what we see simply in terms of a post-assassination shock or trauma at the CIA. In other words, well, maybe there was some sort of association or use of Oswald, and then he shows up in the New York Times shooting the president. That's mortifying. The problem with that is that that doesn't explain why the agency would do something deceptive six weeks before the murder. So you see, this particular piece that we're looking at here tonight has nothing to do with a post-assassination cover-up. It can't. It's six weeks before the assassination. So there really isn't any way of getting around this. So I would just like to uh, 
declare victory in, in, in a certain way and say, we've, we've got them. Um, Oswald was part of an operation, and we know it, and there's no way out of it. He just was. Um, I would like to share with you some more information. Um, this is a lot of information, and I, I want to do this not because we have time to go into all of it, but I'd like to show you what you can do with these new files. And I do this because we're in a battle now over whether or not there's anything in these files. And I believe I've just given you a good example of something that is in them. But more than one particular item, I, um, I think I can convince you that the whole house of cards is about to come tumbling down. If we could have the lights dim again. attempt to show you just what I mean. Whoops, I'm going backwards. Don't want to do that. I, I, I like this one. I have better presentations of this, but this looks like blood on a, an autopsy report, right? The only thing I, I don't have is the, co the coffee stain on, on here. But this is my, in, in my, my own artistry, my rendition of uh, the, the Western Hemisphere Division after about uh, two hours' work. Now, actually, there were hundreds and hundreds of hours that went into organizing the files in order and then subdividing them by division and branch and section. I had some students that helped me do this. We worked for countless hours. And the temptation was always to dive in there and see what they did, but we didn't for weeks and weeks and weeks. But once we were done, we'd gone through all those Jamway cables and all the headquarters cables, it took me two hours to do that. And as you can see, it's um, a complete schematic of the Western Hemisphere Division, including names and phone numbers and in many cases, the root numbers in which these people worked. Pretty amazing, I think. Now, that's out of these new files. Here's a look at the special affairs staff. It's a little neater. Um, I'm still figuring out what some of these things are. I'm very interested in these two branches here under, let's see, they're under um, Intel. And um, I believe this is Probably the B is for branch, and what we're looking at here is chief, probably of military operations branch, and this could, I don't know what this electronic or espionage operations branch, it's probably espionage. But the, the, branch, uh, the branch designations under EOB and SES were very intriguing to me, like AR and HH and NS and SB, and then I found the name here, Seymour Bolt. Some of you may know that name. Then we have Nestor Sanchez, remember? Control for Orlando Cabela. Okay, and then we've got, it's not Howard Hunt, I thought it was. But there's another guy, I forget his name right now, whose initials are in fact HH. These are, end up being the initials of people. Now that's not the case. Over here, this is uh, paramilitary, uh, propaganda, foreign intelligence. Oh, no, maybe it's not. This is propaganda here. I'm not really sure what that one might be. Anyway, um, this is the sort of work that is now possible. What we're doing here is laying out the structure of the Directorate of Plans and its operations. Although this isn't its operations, but I'm going to get to that in a second. Now, um, this is um, something I put together on uh, something known as CIA cryptonyms. Okay, and I showed you a couple of them before, um, Amspell and a few you knew. Um, all cryptonyms start with a, di a digraph, the first two letters, and then are followed by a word. Um, you may recognize one or two of these. Some of you may know by now that ODNV is the FBI, OD Acid is the State Department, OD Urge, I believe is DOD, for, I, I, forgive me if I've made a mistake on that. OD Oak is the U.S. government, uh, PB Prime is U.S., PB Rumen is Cuba, and so on. Here are all the Mexico crypts. Um, many of you have heard of Kubark, but I'm sure you haven't heard of all of these yet. These come out of, uh, out of the files, um, and so on. I have another one. Uh, I'll just throw this one up real quick. And um, most of you have heard of AM Lash or AM Whip, and you might be interested in seeing 
these AMs, quite a few, isn't it? Um, AM operations are all anti-Cuban operations. I, this means they had quite a few anti-Cuban operations, doesn't it? Um, and you can find AM spell in there. I believe AM Bud is on here. That's the CRC here, um, the Cuban Revolutionary Council, and so on. And uh, we're filling in uh, nice files now. You know, it's interesting um, that th although they redact most of this stuff, if you if you get it once, it's 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 usually a good start because a lot of these messages have references to other messages. So it references message 6102. You go to 6102, it's blacked out, but you know it's still the CRC. So it's through the cross-referencing that allows us to build the files on each one of these compartments and begin to fill in the operation. And uh, in fact, I, I think this is very significant work because for the first time, we now have all the boxes to put the pieces in. See, anti-Cuban operations is a huge morass. Thousands of people, all kinds of things going on. But this here, for the first time, allows us to really get all the boxes, sort of start putting the pieces in the right places. Um, some of you may have heard of, of JM Wave. Um, here is about 15 more JM compartments. Um, in fact, you may recognize a ZR rifle. Yeah, I put it up there. I've got about, what, another 10 ZR compartments, a um, bunch of Q, Q uh, compartments. QK Enchant's interesting. QK Enchant, we have a QK Enchant document that has two names associated with it, um, and their agent numbers, and, and one of the two names is Clay Shaw. Um, these are, of course, all the uh, Soviet uh, people we doubled. Um, see, which one is Nosenko? Uh, I forget, maybe a Foxtrot. Um, so, what I'm saying is, is that now we are in a position to lay out the agency's operations and its structure, especially where it concerns anti-Cuban operations, and we're in a position to begin to ask questions uh, such as I was posing before, and to begin, to begin to answer them. Do Oswald's actions have any relevance for these operations? Well, if the FBI is right, and while some of these plots, some of which are, are obviously not nice, like AM dead. Where's that one? <laughs> there it is, AM dead. Yeah, AM dot, by the way, is a collection station, probably an Army or an Air Force one. I, I believe AM ot or dot is Eglin Air Force Base. Uh, I'm sorry, which one? AM what? Probe? Oh, croak, yeah, that's not a nice sound. That doesn't sound very nice either. I, or AM, bang, I like that one. Yeah. Well, what I like about the, the QK and chant thing is that, you know, I, I line these things up trying to see if I can get patterns, and of course, QK and chant is very close to QJ win in terms, the, the, the crip is actually just the first two letters. So the QK and the QJ are very close. And, um, Somebody today told me that, uh, I don't know who it was, maybe it was Dick Russell. Are you here, Dick? Can I talk about that? What, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the poison. Okay, well, it involves, you know, poison and drugs and so on. And how many of you have played a, 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 a medieval game, uh, you know, like Dungeons and Dragons, when you enchant the enemy? What's it, when you, you enchant somebody, you kind of, you know, control their minds, right? I don't know. Maybe maybe Clay Shaw was involved in something like that. Huh? Um, I need the lights on, Frank. So now we can take a magical mystery tour through the former Directorate of Plans and Oswald CI files suggest an operational interest beyond simple curiosity in Oswald. What then? This is something the CIA should think very carefully about before the Assassination Records Review Board begins to deal with the documentary issues which flow from this particular deception. The CIA has released many operational files but has not abandoned all hope of withholding 
many files that it still considers too sensitive. This must change. The current CIA leadership's interests should be with the future, not in the past. And it's not too late to let the rest of the documents out. It's the right thing to do. The same thing applies to the FBI. I talked to you today about FBI files that haven't even been listed in the National Archives. Our position has to be resolute, no more withholding, nothing. We want to see all of these last few hidden pieces. I want to see CD 1359. CD 1359 is a top secret FBI document. And it talks about um, an, a very sensitive uh, FBI source that goes down to Cuba. And then it gets to the part where it says, and Castro said, and then it's all black. Well, we know, we, I mean, we know that it's the solo source, the Childs Brothers, and we know Castro saying it, so what's the source and method? We already know that. They don't, they're not protecting the source and the method. They're protecting what he said. They're protecting the intelligence value. That's not fair. I want to know what the CIA knew that Castro said about what Oswald did inside that embassy. The law of the land is on the side of full release and the people no longer bear any responsibility for figuring out or guessing and being laughed at for doing so. The present presumption that the government must let all it knows the truth out necessitates the CIA's release of the rest of these documents and I think they owe us an explanation too. I, I understand that, that there are probably people alive who are going to get hurt. And I don't take this lightly. I mean people that worked for us in Cuba today. If I can do that, so can the Cubans. If we put these people's lives on the line 30 years ago for some screwball scheme like sending in a mini-sub with a, an explosive seashell, for crying out loud, we can do it again to restore the faith of the American people and their institutions. When we weigh it like that, there's no choice anymore. We've got to release every one of these files. There is, you see, a national security issue at stake, a far deeper one than the sources and methods one arguing against release. It's now a compelling national security issue that the people believe in their institutions. A far more compelling argument for full disclosure. I asked a CIA official I have come to know and respect recently. I said to him, quote, if Oswald had done something for the agency, could the CIA today argue against its release because of sources and methods, unquote? He replied, now that's a question for the Assassination Records Review Board. I thought to myself, boy, I really want to be the fly on the wall when they get to ask that question. In fact, you know, we have to trust these five people, this, this review board. When those doors close and they get that wow briefing, when they're told why this stuff has to remain classified, but I'm betting on those five people. I'm banking on them, yeah. that they're going to do right. Yeah. Now, having said all of this, it's, it's late, so let me summarize and, and take any questions if you have them. I'd, let me just summarize what I think I've said, which is that Oswald appears to have played a role in some sort of intricate headquarters deception operation, obviously involving its Mexico City station. After the assassination, the CIA covered up much of its 8 October through 21 November knowledge of Lee Harvey Oswald's Mexico City activities and his Cuban capers in, in general. And finally, I showed you, I think, that Oswald's Amspell files played a role in the DRE's propaganda activities on the very day of the assassination. The agency's deceptions and denials and lies about Oswald are quite troubling. They are to me, and I'm sure they are to you, too. 
And it's funny, it's the agency's own obdurate attitude that really has drawn me, and probably most of you too, looking into it. I suppose um, I should uh, speculate just one little bit. Can I do that? Just one little bit. I wonder what would have gone through the mind of a conspirator if they had known about these files. If someone had known that Oswald's files were being used in this way. And I think that it's safe to say, looking at the people who read his files, who analyzed his files, that to turn loose Oswald's files is really to turn loose the most sensitive agency components and their operations. In other words, to tell the truth about Lee Harvey Oswald is to take a big camera and shine it from the counterintelligence staff through the Soviet Russia division and on to the special affairs staff. And as I was arguing earlier today, it's the same thing in the FBI. It gets us into the espionage section, the intelligence division, into their most sensitive pieces, into the Navy's O&I, the Naval Investigative um, Functions. It takes us into OSI and the Air Force. It turns some very, very sensitive parts of our government inside out. If someone knew this about Oswald, that would make him the perfect, the perfect person to pick, either to murder Kennedy or to be a patsy, either way. In any event, and I know you're not listening to me, Jerry, but we shouldn't try and close the case without first looking in the files. I thank you very much. Noticed on one of your slides there was a reference to uh, Harvey Lee Oswald, uh, and we know that other such false uh, names were used. Uh, there were sort of uh, takeoffs on Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, can you comment on that, and was there any purpose to that? Well, I don't know um, if there's a purpose, but there's certainly a pattern. And um, the foremost expert in the world on Harvey Lee Oswald is a person by the name of Peter Dale Scott, as well as Lee Henry Oswald, yeah, which Lee is Henry Oswald. That was... the name that was on his 201 file when they, when they opened it. As far as we can determine, it originates um, the, the Harvey Lee Oswald in Mexico City. The Mexico City, uh, the FBI also had a field station in Mexico City. I neglected to mention that earlier this morning, and we have their files. And I believe the earliest reference I've seen is in a in a um, an FBI um, message. Do you think there was a deliberate? Uh, was there a deliberate attempt to? Uh, cause his name to be different in different files for some reason, or do you have any uh, speculation along those well, lines? Well, okay, speculation isn't something I enjoy doing very much, but um, I think that it's safe to say that if you had two or three different versions of something moving through the same bureaucratic channels, it might test those channels, but I really, I, other than that, I couldn't tell you exactly what, what the reason is, but it, it's more than one incident. I've got a file. I've got a Harvey Lee Oswald file, which is now quite substantial. Sir. Uh, you'd said in October in uh, Washington that uh, we're going to have to accept the fact that uh, there was an Oswald threat to kill Kennedy and Cuban embassy. Can you elaborate on that? Well, um, I don't know if I used those exact words, but I, I think that what I said was that what we have to accept is that the FBI was sure 
that he made that threat. Because I don't know if he did. I don't know if he didn't. I do know that Director Kelly said that he probably did it, made such a threat in the Soviet embassy, but he was sure that he did it in the Cuban consulate. Now, we don't have a tape recording. What we do have is what I showed you. We have documents we now know from these documents that there were several cables in October 1963 about Oswald's visit to the Cuban consulate. When you go to the National Archives today and you go into his Directorate of Operations file and you go to the place where those cables are, what you find are pink sheets. We don't even get to see the externals of the message. The entire cables, every single one of them, are classified in their entirety. They've not been released. So, my answer is, they know. And they owe us the answer. And I don't know what it is. Yeah, you know, Blakey had said that um, a high-ranking uh, American intelligence agent had told the committee that uh, they confirmed the, um, the, the essence of that threat. Any idea who that could be, that source? Well, it, Director Kelly's book, and I recommend it highly to all of you. Um, what is it, FBI, uh, uh, FBI story? Somebody help me, Mary. Is that Kelly's title? Right. Well, he was certainly very, very helpful in that. But the book, just for your reference, I believe, is was it a director story? A director story, and uh, uh, Clarence Kelly is the author, and he was the um, director of the FBI after after Jagger Hoover died. Um, he says in that book that we tapped, and it, his the, his exact words is our government tapped Oswald's phone call from the Cuban consulate to the Soviet embassy. Now, that's just one more nail in the coffin. That would be, be my third document. I don't really consider it a document because it's his book, but he made that claim based upon documents that he was looking at. Um, so I guess I'll just have to leave it at that. The FBI is awfully, awfully sure that he did that. Uh, I would prefer to, to reserve judgment till I see what's, what's in those files. <laughs> Next question. One of the documents you showed us listed Oswald's weight as 165 pounds. Could this be a second Oswald? Well, in fact, there are more discrepancies than just the weight. I believe the height is way off by how many inches? Help me out. Two or three inches? Five inches? Okay, five inches. The height's off. So there are a number of these discrepancies, and, and there are all sorts of uh, you know, possibilities. Uh, let me make it clear that... Um, that you know, everything we know, uh, at least everything I know from what I've seen in these files, I could explain one Oswald being there, there could be two Oswalds there, um, the, the real Oswald or the imposter could be doing this, but you know, it doesn't matter really. I don't care if it's just an imposter. That's a hell of a story, somebody down there impersonating Lee Harvey Oswald. And you know, if there's no imposter down there, that's a hell of a story for Oswald to be running around there talking about killing the president or what, whatever it is, is that he's doing and to be part of some sort of a counterintelligence uh, operation here. So I'll take it either way. I really don't care. In fact, if there's a real Oswald and an imposter, that's good too. I mean, take any combination and we've got a hell of a story and we need an answer for it. So, um, you know, whether there's a 10-foot tall Oswald or a 5-foot tall Oswald or, or 10 Oswalds, it doesn't really matter. Um, I hope that wasn't glib. Uh, do you have any files or do you know anybody that has any proof that Oswald was in the Soviet embassy or consulate? Of what he did in the Soviet consulate? What, any proof that he was in the Soviet consulate? Oh, yes. Whatever, uh, whether it's an imposter or the real Oswald, he's certainly there. Now, we went through this last year with Nechiporenko and, and others, and uh, there are problems with um, some of the descriptions of Oswald, some of the clothing he was wearing, um, and uh, the you know, pictures in the passport. There are a number of issues, uh, more than we possibly would have time to go into now, and I can't tell you whether he's in there 
or an imposter is in there. Somebody using Oswald's name is in there. Yeah, we know that. And we know it from several ints. We have people that we had working for us inside the Soviet consulate, and we had the thing bugged. Uh, we had the uh, telephones tapped. I believe that in the case of the Cuban consulate, not to change the subject, that we even had a bug in the armchair of the uh, of the attache, the senior attache in there, because we had the uh, furniture maker uh, on the take. So we had a number of ways to surveil what was going on in these places, not just one. You had me at a disadvantage because I couldn't come last year, one spy case at a time. But what I want to ask you is, why did they censor a name out of the passport to assassination? Was, was there any comment about that when it was translated to American translation on the West Coast? Um, I can't answer your specific question on that. I do know this, that Peter Dale Scott confronted Nechiporenko about a specific issue, and Nechiporenko responded, oh, well, of course I wrote about that, and Peter Scott said, no, you didn't, and Nechiporenko said, oh, yes, I did. Give me my book, and he took his book, and he opened it, and he said, my God, it's missing. It's not there. They've taken it out. So we do know that some things were deleted from his book. Now, but I can't answer your specific... I, under I understand it was the name from a Soviet intelligence agency in the Russian embassy. Could be. Sorry, I can't. Nothing, no comment. It's not a no comment. I'm honestly no, telling you, I, I, I don't know what the answer is to that specific question. If we, if we give you the name, could you put it in your chart later? Oh, yeah. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. Tell us, if you will, about the process that you go through when you see a name that has been blacked out? Are you able to find a separate document that uh, where it has not been blacked out and they're giving you both versions for some reason? Um, you know, is it is it always from a more complete copy or are you able to to just sort of guess and come to an understanding of what that what that is? Tell us well, about that. I would use a number of um, what I would call analytic attack uh, techniques. And first thing I would do is look for another, another copy of the document. As I said, most documents that I have now, I own three or four copies of them. They're always different. I mean, the same person can't possibly redact a half a million pages. So what happens is you've got a, a lot of people that are you know, processing boxes from various parts of the agency, and they do their best to <clears throat> redact what they think is sensitive. So the, the chances are that there'll be another copy somewhere. Now, if you can't get it that way, and you call up um, the people you're interviewing and you say, hey, who do you think this is? And that sometimes you get it that way. And then you can take that chart or those charts that, that I had, and I've recovered all the names of these people, or most of them, uh, just from the general cable traffic. And so I would look at who this cable was from, where it was from, and uh, then I would get my little handy dandy try to say, ah, yeah, well, there's these three guys working that second. He's got to be one of those, and you can do it that way. So there are just there are many ways to, to, to get this information. Once you get a flood of data, it's almost impossible to withhold anything. It really is. Yeah, I find it interesting that there appear to be so many different standards of redacting in this. That's right. Um, do you know, can your... I comment on that, so many different standards of redacting? I think that this is the price the agency has to pay for not having declassified things in a regular way, orderly way, over the years as they should have been. And I'm not talking about things that were not part of the automatic downgrading process, but it's very clear when you look at this material that there are a, num a large percentage of what remained classified until 1994 even was not in that category. So um, what we've had here is an abuse of the classification system, not releasing, and then the people lost faith, then somebody made a movie, uh, irreverent of him, and then we had a law passed that said we have, to, we have to know the truth, and now they've got to let it go by bucket loads. And when you do that, you can't stop things from falling through the cracks, and it's not our fault, it's the fault of the government really for me not doing things the way they should have been doing it all along. On one of your lists, you had the name Q.J. Wynn. Do you know what that term means or who that is? Well, we know a little bit about Q.J. Wynn, yes. Um, and, and, but it, I don't... I think Q.J. Wynn, um, W.I. Rogue, um, uh, Y.Q. Clam, um, and a number of others are involved in the executive action program. In fact, uh, I, was, uh, I was very interested. Somebody today, I wasn't down here, uh, at the time said that, uh, in fact, he's um, identified uh, Q.J. Wynn as Suetra. Yes? Somebody help me out. I'm sorry? Wynn released one time. I don't remember what it was. 
No, somebody gave a briefing today where where they argued who was uh, I guess Lamar uh, has walked out. Right. I don't think we know the the exact answer, but we know a lot more than than we did two or three years ago about Q J Wynn and W R Rogan and a number of these people. He's certainly a European. Uh, and he was brought in to, e to either uh, participate himself directly in these type of operations or to recruit uh, or train people who were. Uh, beyond that, I think we're still kind of filling in the blanks. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. The legend of Lee Harvey Oswald understood this theorem, and it originally had nothing to do with the assassination, but instead, I believe, with covert operations. In the early 1950s, the Cold War and Red Scare were the major moving force in our lives. Our secret government of intelligence agencies, State Department, and military personnel, probably supported by our elected government, decided that human intelligence assets, spies, that is, were needed behind the Iron Curtain. Considerable evidence shows that they created a false defector program as a, mean of, as a means of doing this. In the tradition of such programs, they, pro they possibly gave it a code name, something like maybe Operation Redbird. Uh, signifying those selected to take flight to the Reds. Our theorem proposes that under this operation were numerous projects. One such project was probably called Project Oswald. The equation for this project we'll call LHO squared, or multiplying Oswald by one. That is, Lee Harvey Oswald was multiplied so that officially there would still just be one Oswald, but covertly, a new Oswald would be using the identity of the real birth Oswald. The government would eventually give Marguerite's son, Lee, a new identity. Implementation of false defectors such as this took several years, requiring careful recruiting and training. False defectors needed to be capable in intelligence functions and fluent in language. Their defections had to seem plausible to the Russians, and they needed an identity wholly free of traceable intelligence connections, and this is known as plausible deniability. Thus it was that a patriotic youth named Lee Harvey Oswald was recruited through his relatives and associates, such as David Ferry, to lend his identity to a lookalike youth whose parents were probably Eastern European or Russian refugees recruited by U.S. intelligence. So from a point in the early 1950s, Project Oswald created a second Lee Harvey Oswald, and there were two of them 
until November 24, 1963, when the substitute Oswald was killed by Jack Ruby. The events of that November weekend created a governmental crisis of great proportions, requiring immediate cover-up because it could never be made public that a person created by, the government, by a government agency was the accused assassin. The original Oswald may still survive today, perhaps living somewhere in Florida with his new government-provided identity. You may say all this sounds like crazy speculation, but John Armstrong and I will now show you evidence which has existed since 1963 that we think solves the equation and answers the Oswald problem, and you can decide for yourself. For many years, I have studied numerous photos, all purported to be the same person, Lee Harvey Oswald. I even produced a research video of my findings called The Many Faces of Lee Harvey Oswald. In 1993, John Armstrong persuaded me that I should take my study of Oswald faces much further because the eight or nine photos in my study demonstrated the likelihood of two Oswalds and several fabricated photo Oswalds, but it did not tell the complete story of how Oswald was multiplied. So I produced this compilation of 77 Oswald faces as a research poster, which I call the evolution of Lee Harvey Oswald. Even casual examination of the various photos alleged to be Oswald shows that not all of them depict the person we know as the historical Oswald. From age two and through childhood and marine service to age 24, we can see that the person called Oswald underwent many puzzling changes. Sometimes he had a broad square chin. Sometimes he had a sharply pointed chin. Sometimes he had a thick bull neck which his brother Robert had described to the Warren Commission. Sometimes he had a scrawny, thin neck. Sometimes he had thick, curly hair, sometimes thinning hair, sometimes a receding hairline. Sometimes his nose was broad and flat, other times very thin and pointed. Sometimes on the same date, he was in two places at once, sometimes half a world apart, looking like two different persons. Once he was photographed with a head 13, 13 inches long and shoulders only four foot four off the ground. Once he was photographed with a missing front tooth Some Oswald photos appear to be photo composites of two different faces wh which have been spliced together for some mysterious purpose. I say that composite photos are not created of ordinary people, but maybe they are common in intelligence circles. And many of the photos simply do not look like the historical Oswald that we know, the Oswald in the Dallas police mugshot in the center there. When you factor these 77 faces into the Oswald equation, you have solved the Oswald problem by determining that the square root of LHO equals two, not one. When you see for yourself that these photos do not all depict the same person, you're on your way toward unraveling the mystery of the century and learning the truth. Among the desperate government myths, lies, and cover-ups of the last 30 years, such as the single bullet theory, is the official theory that one man, Lee Harvey Oswald, acting alone, killed President Kennedy. However, the government's secret, above all others, is that the historical Oswald was a government creation. This secret, which would reveal the participation of a government agency in the assassination has been available all these years in existing evidence. One man alone, digging through 30-year-old evidence for two years, 
has extensively documented and proved this equation that LHO times LHO or LHO squared equals LHO framed. And now Jim is going to introduce you to my fellow researcher, John Armstrong. Okay, is this on? Yes. Okay, John, we're going. If we could have the lights for just a half minute. Mainly I got here because John wanted to make sure that this microphone was on. Uh, what we're dealing with here is admittedly pretty bizarre, and it's and it's and it took me a long time. And I'm I'm I think you all agree I'm about as familiar with this case as anybody. And it took me a while to grasp what all this means and to understand and to put it all together. But as I began to understand and as it became came came home to me what what we were dealing with here, it was like a light bulb going on because now when they talk about all of this material still classified. Good time, yeah. I saw the light. But now it really does. All of a sudden now, maybe there is national security involved here, okay? And before I introduce John, let me just tell you something that, that uh, Marguerite told me years and years ago, and it didn't re really make any impact. And, uh, but just so you don't think I'm just making this up at this late date, Go to uh, the Warren Commission, Exhibit 1808, and in there you will read an interview with Marguerite Oswald that was published in a European publication in 1964. And in there she repeats the same story she told me that I didn't know quite what this meant at the time way back in the mid-70s, but today, and in light of the material we're presenting here, it takes on much more significance. In 1955, Marguerite said, Lee Harvey Oswald shows up at home one afternoon in the company of a military officer. And this officer told her, Mrs. Oswald, the country needs boys like Lee, bright, educated, loyal. And so this officer went on to encourage her to sign for Lee so that he could join the Marines uh, being, even though he was a year underage. And she said she hesitated for a little bit, but then she gave her consent. And sure enough, as we know, Lee tried to join the Marines. They were about to process him when they realized he was too young or some other problem came up. They sent him back home. So did he come home? Was he all discouraged and languishing around? No. According to Marguerite, he was excited. He saw something coming up in his future. And she he took his brother's Marine Corps manual, manual and he studied it for that whole year. And a year later, uh, upon turning the proper age, he was able to enlist in the Marines and go off on to his great adventure. Think about that a minute. I don't recall any military officers coming to my parents and saying they need somebody like me to come in there. The draft board came after me, but, uh, <laughs> but not a military officer. So just keep that in mind. And with that, and, and keep it in mind that, that see if we can't put into context here why there should be such a hesitancy on the part of the government to delve into this whole topic of who is Lee Harvey Oswald. Let me now present Oklahoma researcher John Armstrong, and I think you're going to find some of the material he has to present is pretty incredible. And let me tell you, I think he's really done his homework and even though you might disagree with the conclusions of his work, uh, the, the uh, investigative and the probing uh, cannot be denied. John? I think you want to you want this projector still. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. There you go. My study of Lee Harvey Oswald focuses on altered, forged, or misleading government documents and structured witness testimony. The public documents I will present have been overlooked during the last 30 years 
because they may have seemed insignificant or been misunderstood. Some, some items are trivial, some items are significant, but one thing is certain. There's a mountain of confusing and conflicting information surrounding the life of Lee Oswald. I will show you Warren Commission documents and testimony, newspaper articles, photographs, and items from the Dallas Police Archives concerning Oswald. This information may cause you to question the official story of his life. As you begin to see unusual occurrences and puzzling photographs throughout his life, I urge you to draw your own conclusions as to their meaning. To begin with, I was familiar with Jack White's photographic study of Oswald. In August 1993, I suggested to Jack that we create a photographic chronology of Oswald's life. The slide you see here is the result of our joint study. <coughs> Jack, yep. change slide. Oh, there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> this 1958 photo appeared in Robert Oswald's book, Lee. The caption says the photo was taken when Lee was on leave from the Marines in February 1958. But in February 1958, he was officially in the Philippines. His only leave in 1958 was from November 19th to December 21st. The man in Robert's photo does not look like the Oswald who was killed in Dallas. I compared Robert Oswald's 1958 photo with photos of Lee taken in 1956 in Fort Worth, the one on the left, and in 1958 in the Philippines, the one on the right. I compared Robert Oswald's 1958 hunting photo on the left with another photo Robert took of Lee in September 1959. On the left is Lee's passport photo taken on September 4, 1959. Ten days later, Robert took the photo on the right. They do not look like the same person, even though ten days apart. In the Dallas Police Archives, I found a copy of a 1959 Fort Worth Star Telegram article concerning Oswald's defection. The text of the article was legible, but the photo was poorly reproduced. When I later found an original clipping of the article at the University of Texas at Arlington, my attention was drawn to the photograph of Oswald. That photo looked very different from the Oswald killed in Dallas. I could not help but wonder if the copy of the photograph in the Dallas Police Archives had been intentionally distorted. The one on the top left, Robert's 1958 photo of Lee, reminded me of the Star Telegram photo in the center. The differences in these six photos caused me to wonder if there were two Lee Oswalds. I started to separate documents, testimony, and photographs of Lee Oswald as though I were dealing with two people. My investigation of Oswald's life began in Fort Worth in 1952 when he attended the sixth grade at Ridgely West Elementary School. Classmate Richard Garrett remembered Oswald, quote, as being the tallest, most dominant member of our group in grade school. Garrett would not see Oswald again until high school, two and a half years later. According to the Warren Commission, Lee and his mother drove to New York in August 1952. Lee was ready to enter junior high school in New York. Robert Oswald's testimony to the Warren Commission indicates that Lee may have attended W.C. Stripling Junior High in Fort Worth rather than junior high school in New York. When Warren Commission Attorney Jenner asked Robert if he had entered W.C. Stripling as a seventh grader, Robert replied, yes, sir, high school, junior high school. When Marguerite was interviewed by Mr. Pierre, she stated, yes, when we lived in Fort Worth, Texas, he went to school up there until the eighth grade, which is junior high. His mother and his brother said he went to junior high in Fort Worth, but the Warren Commission and New York school records show that Oswald entered the seventh grade in New York, not Fort Worth. Were both Marguerite and Robert wrong? In 1993, I contacted the current principal of W.C. Stripling Junior High School in Fort Worth, Mr. Galindo. Mr. Galindo told me he had taught at this school since 1973 and had been principal for the last six years. When he first began teaching, several teachers told him they remembered Oswald attending Stripling. However, Mr. Galindo could not remember their names. He suggested I contact the Fort Worth Independent School District to see if they had any records pertaining to Oswald. 
They had no records of Oswald attending Stripling Junior High School, but gave me a list of some of the teachers who had taught there in the early 1950s. The assistant principal of Stripling at that time was Mr. Frank Cudlady. Mr. Cudlady is now superintendent of schools in Waco, Texas. I spoke with Mr. Cudlady for the first time last week for nearly an hour. He told me a very interesting story. Frank said that early on Saturday, November 23, 1963, the day following the assassination, he was telephoned by the principal of Stripling, Mr. Weldon Lucas. Mr. Lucas told him to meet the FBI at Stripling as soon as possible and give the FBI all records pertaining to Oswald's attendance at Stripling. Mr. Cudlady met with two FBI agents, located Oswald's records, briefly looked at those records, and gave them to the FBI. He was not given a receipt for the records, nor was he able to copy the records, as the school did not have a copy machine. He did, however, notice Oswald's grades and remember that Oswald had attended a semester at Stripling. Further corroboration of Oswald attending Stripling came from students who remembered him. Mr. Gann of Fort Worth, who teaches law, remembered Oswald as being in his gym class. After thinking about what Frank had told me, several questions came to mind. How did the FBI know so quickly after the assassination that Oswald had attended Stripling? Why was the FBI interested in his Stripling Junior High School records? Why were two FBI agents sent to pick up records at a school where Oswald was not supposed to have attended? Mr. Cudlady met the FBI at Stripling less than 20 hours after Oswald had been arrested. How did they know that Oswald attended Stripling when Warren Commission records and court records show him to be attending junior high in New York? The FBI confiscated his junior high school records. They were not turned over to the Warren Commission, nor had they been seen since. The Warren Commission tells us that Oswald left Fort Worth and moved to New York with his mother in August 1952, where he attended junior high school for a year and a half. He then moved to New Orleans, where he completed junior high at Beauregard. He did not, according to the Warren Commission, ever attend junior high in Fort Worth. Yet Oswald's school records existed and were given to the FBI by Mr. Cudlady. Stripling school records and several students place Oswald at Stripling Junior High School at the same time New York records show him to be attending school in New York. While Lee Oswald was attending Stripling in Fort Worth, who was living at the same time with Marguerite Oswald in New York using the name Lee Harvey Oswald? If Oswald did not attend junior high in Fort Worth, then why did the FBI go to Stripling in the first place? Why did they ask for and obtain junior high school records for Lee Oswald? What happened to those records? One thing is certain, someone in the FBI knew the significance of Oswald attending Stripling. Someone knew that Oswald was not supposed to be attending Stripling in Fort Worth because he was supposed to be attending school in New York at that time. The reason for the FBI's expediency in obtaining those records, hiding those records, and not making them available to the Warren Commission is obvious. Someone knew. Someone in a high position at the FBI knew about the existence of two Lee Oswalds. John and Marge Pick were residing temporarily at her parents' apartment on East 92nd Street in New York when Marguerite and Lee showed up unexpectedly. John Pick stated that Marguerite, quote, enrolled Lee in a neighborhood school. She enrolled him in a public school in New York City located on about 89th or 90th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. That comes from Warren Commission testimony. This was only two blocks from the Pick's apartment. The Warren Commission, however, relied on a report from the FBI stating that Lee Oswald entered the seventh grade at Trinity Evangelical Lutheran School in September 1952. Trinity was located in the Bronx, many miles from the Pick's apartment. In their December 1963 report, shown here, the FBI stated that Trinity, quote, did not maintain any school records until 1957. Now, if the school records were not maintained, which is highly unlikely, and no one remembered Oswald as a student, then how did the FBI conclude that Oswald had attended this school? This is an early example of an inadequate investigation by the FBI where their conclusions were drawn not from facts, but from suppositions. 
Lee was next enrolled at public school 117 in the Bronx from September 30th, 1952 to January 13th, 1953. He attended only 15 days. Due to his failure to attend school, a truancy hearing was conducted by the Board of Education. Neither Lee nor Marguerite attended. Marguerite and Lee moved to the public school 44 district in January 1953, where Lee failed to register or attend school. On April 16, 1953, a court hearing was held. <clears throat> Lee was remanded to the youth house, a detention home on Manhattan's Lower East Side for psychiatric evaluation. Marguerite told the Warren Commission, quote, Lee was in this home for boys. Now I believe it was, this home was in Brooklyn. I may have the name wrong, it was an old, old home in Brooklyn. Warren Commission records tell us that Lee Oswald was remanded to the youth house located on the Lower East Side in Manhattan. But Marguerite said that she visited Lee at a different facility, the Warwick Home for Boys in the Bronx. Warren Commission Rankin, attorney Rankin, was aware of yet another possible placement of Lee Oswald. He asked Marguerite if Lee Oswald was committed to the Berkshire Farms. Why is there confusion as to where Lee was placed? He was only in the custody of the court for three weeks. Was he at the Youth House, Berkshire Farms, or the Warwick Home for Boys? Again, the records for this period are incomplete and confusing. An unusual discussion occurred during Warren Commission hearings between Attorney Rankin and Marguerite. It concerned a statement made by Marguerite's former housekeeper. Mr. Rankin, before you left New York, did you ever tell anybody that you took Lee Oswald to New York so he could have mental tests at the Jacoby Hospital? No, sir. My child was a normal child, and while in New York, I explained to you he had a dog with puppies. He had a bicycle. There was nothing abnormal about Lee Oswald. Did you notice how Marguerite avoided answering Rankin's question about the Jacoby Hospital? She tried to shift the focus of his question by explaining that her son was normal and even had a dog with puppies. In doing so, however, the statements that she made to Rankin were incorrect. Lee Oswald did have a dog. The dog did have puppies. But the event was not in New York in 1953, but rather in Fort Worth, Texas in 1949. He gave his teacher, Mrs. Livingston, a puppy for Christmas present. Marguerite Oswald's memory was off by four years. The point here is not that Lee had a dog with puppies, but rather that Marguerite avoided answering a direct question concerning the possibility that Lee had come to New York for mental tests at the Jacoby Hospital. The point was never again raised by the Warren Commission. On May 7, 1953, Oswald was brought to court. Lee was ordered to return to school and to attend regularly. He entered public school 44 the next day and attended school until June 1st. We have just seen that court and board of education records show Oswald attended less than three weeks of school for the 1953 spring semester. Yet Warren Commission records obtained by the FBI and used as Warren Commission exhibits show him attending 109 days of school during the 1953 semester. The government wants us to believe the Warren Commission report, but that report shows Oswald to be a chronic truant who was placed under the supervision of the court and in need of psychiatric attention in the spring of 1953. That same report shows Oswald attended 109 days during the spring semester of 1953. What are we to believe? Either way, he entered the eighth grade in the fall of 1953. Employment records show that Marguerite Oswald worked at Lady Orva Hosiery in New York from May through December of 1953, including the entire summer of 1953. She lived with, she lived with, Lee lived with her in New York during this period in an apartment on 179th Street. Two discrepancies relating to Lee Oswald during the summer of 1953 have never been explained. The first relates to a photograph taken of Lee by his brother Robert. The second relates to Lee's whereabouts during the summer of 1953. Robert said he took this picture of Lee at the Bronx Zoo in the summer of 1953 while on leave from the Marines. This photo is Warren Commission Exhibit 2893. It appears in Life magazine on page 69 of the February 21st, 1964 issue, together with numerous photos of a young Lee Oswald. When John Pick testified before the Warren Commission, he was shown the Life magazine photos of Lee for identification. 
he identified the photos of Lee from age 2 to age 12. Yet when he was shown the photo of Lee taken at the Bronx Zoo, he told Warren Commission Attorney Jenner, Sir, from that picture, I could not recognize that that is Lee Harvey Oswald. Jenner asked, that fellow is shown here. He doesn't look like you recall Lee looked in 1952 and 53 when you saw him in New York City. Pick, no sir. John Pick identified the top left photo taken in 1952 as his brother Lee. The top right photo was taken of Lee in New Orleans in 1955. The photo on the bottom was taken by Robert in the summer of 1953. This is the photo that John Pick told the Warren Commission was not his brother. If the photo was not of Lee Oswald, then who was it? John Pick now lives in Lynn Haven, Florida. When I asked him about the photo, Pick stated that he gave his testimony to the Warren Commission in 1964. He will stand by that testimony and has nothing further to say. The second discrepancy concerning, concerns Oswald residing in Stanley, North Dakota in the summer of 1953. Allegedly, he was in New York at this time, living with his mother in the 179th Street apartment. She was working from May 53 through December 53 at Lady Orva Hosiery in New York. When Oswald defected to Russia in 1959, he was interviewed by Eileen Mosby, a reporter for UPI at the Metropole Hotel. During a two-hour interview, he told Mosby that when he left New York, he had then moved to North Dakota. It's interesting to note that Mosby's handwritten notes from that interview show that Oswald told her that he left New York and then moved to North Dakota. But in her typewritten transcript, the one that wound up in the Warren Commission report, there's no mention of North Dakota. The FBI was well aware that Oswald said he had lived in North Dakota. A December 1963 teletype sent to the FBI's Phoenix, Arizona office states, quote, newspaper articles in 1959 when subject defected to Russia, quoted him, Oswald, as saying he had lived in North Dakota. In August 1963, Oswald was arrested by the New Orleans police for causing a disturbance while passing out fair play for Cuba literature. He was questioned by intelligence officer Francis Martello. Oswald told Martello, we moved to North Dakota and I discovered one book in the library, Das Kapital. Lee Oswald said this in August 1963. Following the assassination, Mrs. Alma Cole of Yuma, Arizona, wrote a letter to President Lyndon Johnson. She said her son, William Timmer, had known and befriended Oswald in Stanley, North Dakota in 1953. Timmer was interviewed by FBI agent Donald Head on December 21st and 22nd, 1963. In the summer of 1953, Timmer said he and other boys his age met a teenager at the city park who introduced himself as Harve, or Harvey Oswald. Oswald told the group he had been in New York City and talked of gang fighting with weapons made from razor blades stuck in potatoes. Timmer remembered being in a fight with Oswald in the city park. He recalled that it seemed odd to him that Oswald ro rode a bike as he seemed too old for that sort of thing. Shortly after I met him, Oswald talked about communism. This is the earliest known occurrence of Oswald's reading communist literature or books. Timmer said that Oswald took three pamphlets from his back pocket and said, I'll bet you've never seen anything like this before. Timmer said the pamphlets were about communism. Now, how many of you remember Oswald saying that he first became interested in communism when an old lady standing on a street corner handed him a pamphlet about saving the Rosenbergs in New York? Those pamphlets were published by the Communist Party. Could this be the pamphlet that Timmer saw? Oswald said he'd been all over the country but did not talk of his family. Timmer did not see Oswald at school in the fall of 1953, and he is certain he did not attend school in Stanley. Timmer reviewed his elementary school records and carefully determined with certainty that he met Oswald in the summer of 1953. The thought occurred to me that Timmer invented the story. However, in 1959 in Moscow, Oswald himself told Eileen Mosby he had lived in North Dakota. Timmer would have no way of knowing the contents of that interview. Timmer also would have no way of knowing that while in the custody of the New Orleans Police Department in August 1963, 
Lee Harvey Oswald himself told Officer Martello that he had lived in North Dakota. I located Timmer, who was 54 years old, and spoke with him two weeks ago. He told me he'd never seen a copy of his interview with the FBI, yet he remembered his association with Lee Oswald clearly enough to tell me virtually everything he told the FBI in 1963. Mr. Timmer was emphatic. Lee Oswald was in Stanley, North Dakota in 1953. Now what Oswald was doing in North Dakota, who he's living with up there, and when and how he left remain a mystery. If Oswald was in North Dakota in 1953, who was living in New York at the same time with the name Lee Oswald? An interesting footnote to the North Dakota episode occurred during State Department security hearings in 1964. Attorney Jules G. Sauerwein questioned State Department official Abba P. Schwartz about his knowledge of Oswald residing in North Dakota. These State Department security hearings were held in July 1964 and were closed to the public. The FBI interviewed Timmer in 1963. The FBI, a UPI person, State Department officials, aides to President Johnson, members of the Secret Service, and officers of the New Orleans Police Department knew of Lee Harvey Oswald's presence in North Dakota. Why there is no mention of Oswald's activities in North Dakota in the Warren Report is unexplained. His presence in North Dakota would be difficult to understand and impossible for the proponents of the Warren Report to explain. In the fall of 1953, Oswald begins the eighth grade at Public School 44 in New York. He attended regularly during the fall term of 1953. School records show he attended school 62 days with three absences. The court received a progress report on Oswald from Public School 44 on October 21, 1953. On November 19, a hearing was held. Mrs. Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald, and Mr. Nielsen, an attorney, were present. On January 4, 1954, Mrs. Oswald was contacted at her apartment by a parole officer. She advised him that she and Lee planned to return to New Orleans. January 6, 1954 is the last time Marguerite and Lee were known to be in New York. They were visited by William E. Gretz of Big Brothers Incorporated at their Bronx apartment. Officially, they moved to New Orleans in January of 1954 where Lee was enrolled in Beauregard Junior High School. <coughs> Beauregard school records for Lee Harvey Oswald are full of inconsistencies. They are just too numerous to discuss at this time. Warren Commission 1413 shows Lee Oswald's Beauregard Junior High School records. Please note, there are three lines for his eighth grade year. That would be this line, this line, and this line. And there are three lines for his ninth grade year. This one, this one, and this one. The top line highlighted in yellow shows his grade and attendance for the fall term of 1953. The second line, that line, is for the spring term in 1954. The third line is the average of the fall and the spring term and shows his yearly grade and attendance record. Please look at the top line highlighted in yellow, all the way to the right. This shows Lee Harvey Oswald attended a general science class, that's there. He received a grade of 70. A physical education class, where is that, Dad? Where's well, the end? Right there. Sorry, it isn't any larger. Physical education class where he received a grade of 70. He was absent one time, not tardy, and right here he attended 89 days. 89 days in the fall semester of 1953, 90 days, or is that 70, in the spring term of 1953, and for the whole entire school year, the 53-54 school year, 179 days. Now what you've just seen here are two separate Warren Commission documents that show Lee Harvey Oswald 
attended this fall school term of 1953 in both New York and New Orleans at the same time. The bottom one is his New York records. 9-14-53, he enters public school 44 in the Bronx. He attends 62 and eight one-half days, three and eight one-half days absences, and he's late once. This is the 53-54 school year. On the top line is the fall semester of that year, where he attended 89 days. The FBI obtained public school 44 and Beauregard records in 1963. Why was his attendance at both schools at the same time not investigated nor questioned by the FBI or members of staff of the Warren Commission? According to these documents, Lee Oswald was attending school in New York for 62 days and at the same time was attending school in New Orleans for 89 days. If both records are correct, then there were two Lee Oswalds. Indications of two Lee Oswalds from photographs, live witnesses, school records, and FBI interviews would continue until his death. The possibility of two Oswalds was known to the FBI as early as June 1960, when J. Edgar Hoover wrote this memo regarding the, possi the possibility that an imposter may be using Oswald's birth certificate. In, in 1964, Army Intelligence Colonel Philip James Corso was working for Senator Richard Russell of the Warren Commission. I met with Colonel Corso at his home in Jupiter, Florida on several occasions. He told me that Senator Russell asked him to quietly conduct an investigation into the Oswald matter. Colonel Corso reported to Senator Russell that there had been two United States passports issued to Lee Harvey Oswald and had been used by two different men. He obtained this information from the head of the United States Passport Office, Francis Knight. He also reported to Senator Russell that there were two birth certificates in the name of Lee Harvey Oswald and that they were used by two different people. He obtained that information from William Sullivan, head of the FBI's Domestic Intelligence Division. Corso said that he and Senator Russell had concluded the assassination had been the result of a conspiracy. Corso also said that as a result of his findings, Senator Russell stopped going to Warren Commission meetings. I checked the Warren volumes to see how many sessions had been attended by each member. Senator Russell attended the least number of meetings of any of the seven members. As we shall see during the rest of my presentation, there are indications that the FBI, Warren Commission attorneys, and other government agencies knew about the existence of two Oswalds and tried to either avoid or cover up the issue. While researching the possibility of two Oswalds, I remembered a couple of isolated incidents that seemed what somewhat out of character. One of those occurred when Oswald first came to New York. He told probation officer John Caro that he was not liked by his classmates because of his southern drawl. Yet a year and a half later, when he moved to New Orleans, he was ridiculed because of his northern accent. He was even nicknamed Yankee. How a southern boy could acquire a northern accent after living in New York only a year and a half is not adequately explained. The second incident occurred in New Orleans in 1954 when a group of white boys beat up Oswald for sitting in the Negro section of a bus. While this southern boy would not know better than to sit in the Negro section of a bus in the early 1950s is unexplained. Not knowing the seating arrangements on a bus between blacks and whites in the early 1950s is clearly more indicative of a northerner or a foreigner than a person who grew up in the deep south. This behavior also remains unexplained. Edward Vogel met Lee Oswald while attending Beauregard in 1955. Vogel witnessed Oswald in a fight with a person who looked like, quote, a tremendous football player. Vogel got some ice for Oswald, attempted to patch him up, and became friendly with him. Vogel's testimony appears in volume eight, page three of the Warren Commission volumes. He told the Warren Commission that Oswald's lip was cut and his tooth was knocked out in that fight. Vogel took photographs at Beauregard for the school yearbook. 
He took a photograph in Mrs. Dufour's English class that appears in Life magazine, this one shown here, on page, t page 70 of the February 21st, 1964 edition. Oswald clearly appears to have a missing front tooth in this photo. Vogel's testimony in the classroom photo appear to show Oswald missing a front tooth. In 1981, Oswald's body was exhumed and autopsied. Dr. Lyndon Norton showed that Oswald's marine dental records matched the teeth of the exhumed body. Neither the marine dental records nor her final autopsy report showed any broken tooth. I wanted to look at those x-rays myself to see if they showed any evidence of a broken tooth. In 1994, Marina Oswald loaned me numerous x-rays and photographs taken at that exhumation. The x-rays and photographs were taken to two dentists. Both said, without a doubt, the x-rays showed natural front teeth with no caps, fillings, or other dental work that would indicate a broken front tooth. If Vogel's friend had had a front tooth knocked out, how do you explain the exhumed body of Lee Harvey Oswald having unbroken natural teeth? This brings us to another interesting discrepancy. When Dr. Norton examined the dental x-rays of the exhumed body, she compared them to x-rays furnished to her by the government allegedly made of Oswald at El Toro, California on March 27, 1958. But there's a problem here. Oswald's official whereabouts in March 1958 are well known. According to the official record from March 7 through March 18, he was aboard the USS Wexford County en route from the Philippines to Japan. From March 19 through April 11, he was at Itsugi awaiting court-martial for possession of a derringer with which he accidentally shot himself. Are we to believe that while awaiting trial in Japan, he was secretly flown to California and back for a dental exam? <clears throat> in the fall of 1955, Oswald entered Warren Easton High School in New Orleans, dropped out on October 14th. According to the Warren Commission, he then worked for three companies in New Orleans before moving to Fort Worth in 1956. These were Two Jacks, J.R. Michaels, and the Fisterer Dental Labs. His employment as a teenager in New Orleans may seem insignificant, but a close look at his dates of employment with these companies as compared to official Warren Commission records show us something very different. Officially, Oswald worked at these companies from November 1955 through June 1956, eight months. But interviews with Oswald's co-workers and FBI interviews that were not part of the Warren Commission volumes show that Oswald may have worked at Two Jacks from July of 55 through July of 56 and at the Fister Dental Laboratories from October 57 through July of 58, a total employment of two years. His employment during these times is crucial to our understanding of Oswald. His employment in New Orleans during 1957 and 1958 is at the time when Warren Commission records tell us he's in the Marines in Japan. I would like to discuss his employment with the Jared F. Tujak Company first. House Select Committee Attorney Blakey tried to say there were mafia connections to the Tujak restaurant in New Orleans. He tried to make a connection between the mafia and Tujak's restaurant and by inference, the Tujak Company where Oswald worked in 1956. There is no connection and there never has been any connection whatsoever between Two Jack's Restaurant and Jared F. Two Jack Incorporated, freight forwarders. In 1956, Two Jack's was owned by Jared F. Two Jack and had some 20 employees. The company's main business was freight forwarding. Frank Benedetto was Oswald's supervisor when he worked for Two Jack's. Frank remembered Oswald well and described him as a model employee who was always on time for work and was trusted enough to make their bank deposits. He said Oswald was a valued employee and never once spoke about communism. When Mr. Tujak died, Frank purchased the company. Until six months ago, their offices were located at 442 Canal, the same location as when Oswald worked there. According to Warren Commission records, Oswald began working for Tujaks on November 10th 1955, terminated his employment two months later on January 10, 1956. 
These dates came from an FBI interview with Mr. Tujak and from handwritten payroll records. There was no hard evidence at all in the form of canceled checks, no time cards, no year-end W-2 forms issued to Lee Oswald to substantiate these dates of employment. No employees were interviewed. His dates of employment, as reported to us by the Warren Commission, came only from Mr. Tujak. How reliable is this information provided by Jared Tujak? Who was Jared Tujak? Mr. Tujak apparently was quite interested in Cuban affairs. When Guy Bannister incorporated the Friends for Democratic Cuba, Gerard Tujak was listed as vice president. Guy Bannister was not only one of the incorporators, but was also on the board of directors of the Friends for Democratic Cuba. Jared F. Tujak Incorporated may have been a very convenient place for young Oswald to have worked. Frank Benedetto testified before the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Frank was Oswald's supervisor, and he told the committee that Oswald had worked for Tujak's, quote, a year to a year and a half. Frank clearly remembered when Oswald quit. Oswald told Frank he was quitting in order to join the Marines. Oswald left New Orleans in July 1956 and moved to Fort Worth where he joined the Marines in October. Frank's memory of Oswald working for him for a year to a year and a half differs significantly from that of Mr. Tujak, who told the FBI that Oswald had worked there only two months. If Oswald had indeed worked for Tujak's for a year to a year and a half, then he must have started working for Tujak sometime in the summer of 1955. A clue to when Lee Oswald started working for Tujak's may be found in the testimony of Robert Oswald. Robert told the Warren Commission that when he got out of the Marines in July 1955, he stayed with Marguerite and Lee for one week before moving permanently to Fort Worth. Robert stated, quote, Lee was working for an export firm there in New Orleans. That was July 55. If Lee was working for two jacks in 55 through July of 56 when he quit to join the Marines, then Frank D. Benedetto's memory of Oswald's employment is probably correct. For the corroboration of Oswald's employment comes from Gloria Callahan, who was a secretary at Two Jacks. She took a leave of absence to have her first child in April and May of 1956. She clearly remembers Oswald working at Two Jacks at that time. Gloria has remained friends with Frank and Harriet Di Benedetto, visits them often, and lives outside of New Orleans. <coughs> the dates of Oswald's employment at Two Jacks, again, is critical. If Oswald did in fact work for Two Jacks in July of 56, quit, quit Two Jacks in July of 56, he simply did not have time to work at either of the two companies, J.R. Michaels or Fisterers, before joining the Marines. After Two Jacks, the Warren Commission tells us he went to work for the J.R. Michaels company. J.R. Michaels was located one floor below Two Jacks in 1956, 442 Canal Street. J.R. Michaels was a small freight forwarding company with no more than five employees. The office manager in 1956 was Nick Mazza. Frank Benedetto, office manager at Tujak's, knew Nick quite well. Frank and Nick would often visit each other's offices during the day. When I told Frank Benedetto last fall that Oswald had gone to work for J.R. Michaels after quitting Tujak's, Frank was stunned. He said there was no way that Oswald could have worked for J.R. Michaels without his knowing about it. Besides, Frank said, when he left us, he went to join the Marines. The Warren Commission said Oswald had worked for J.R. Michaels for two weeks. Frank D. Benedetto said he could not have worked there. What does Nick Mazza, J.R. Michaels' office manager, have to say? Nick says he does not remember Oswald working for J.R. Michaels. Nick says that on the Monday following the assassination, he arrived at his office to find two FBI agents inquiring about Oswald's employment at J.R. Michaels. Nick explained to them that he had been the office manager during 1956 and had only two or three employees. Oswald was not one of them. Nick explained that his company was in the freight forwarding business and as such was constantly in contact with the U.S. Customs Office, which was directly across the street. The FBI interviewed Ms. Doris Nakari, who was the supervisor in charge of the export control section of the U.S. Customs Office. 
she explained that she would have custody of a file on Lee Harvey Oswald during the time he was employed by J.R. Michaels. She said neither Oswald nor his photograph rang a bell. The FBI also in intervie interviewed Mrs. Lucille Legulian. She said she and other employees of that section had recently read that Oswald was employed as his delivery boy for the J.R. Michaels company. She said Oswald would have had to have come to her office with export declarations to be authenticated. She said she and other employees of the export control section had discussed Oswald and all stated they had seen Oswald's picture in the newspaper and on television recently, but none recognized him and none stated they recalled having seen him at any time. She further said that Oswald would have had to have had an identification photograph at the export control section along with a brief file concerning him and the name of the firm he represented. Whether or not Oswald worked at J.R. Michaels remains unanswered. The evidence from Nick Mazza, Frank DiMenedetto, the employees of the U.S. Customs Office, and the lack of required documentation from the U.S. Customs House would suggest that he did not work at J.R. Michaels. From a different point of view, what evidence is there that he did work there? Oswald's final place of employment, according to the Warren Commission, is the Fisterer Dental Laboratory. The Warren Commission tells us that after quitting J.R. Michaels, he worked, quote, several months thereafter for the Fister Dental Laboratory. If Frank DiBenedetto's memory was correct about Oswald working at Two Jacks until he left to join the Marines, which is July of 55, there's no time during 1956 that Oswald could have been employed by Fisterers. Neither the FBI nor the Warren Commission obtained payroll records, canceled checks, employment applications, copies of W-2 forms, or any documents to substantiate the time that he worked at Fister's in 1956. The available evidence, in fact, shows that he worked at Fister's in 1957 and 1958. For now, I would like to continue discussing Oswald during the fall of 1956, at which time he returned to Fort Worth. Oswald entered Arlington Heights High School in Fort Worth in September 1956. His friend from grade school, Richard Garrett, who remembered Oswald as being the tallest kid in the class, the leader of our group, did not recognize Oswald in high school. The left photo of Oswald in grade school in 1952 is when he was a classmate of Richard Garrett. The photo on the right was taken at Arlington Heights High School in Fort Worth in 1956. Garrett was interviewed by Life Magazine in 1964. He said, I remember I had to look down on him in high school, and it seemed strange because he had been the tallest, most dominant member of our gr group in grammar school. He was very different from the way I remembered him. He even tried to sell me on communism. Lee dropped out of high school and enlisted in the Marines on October 24th, the next day he arrived in San Diego. Warren Commission Exhibit 1962 is a statement by Alan R. Feld. He gave this statement to the FBI, which is Warren Commission number 1962. His statement differs significantly with Warren Commission records. Warren Commission records show Oswald attended radar school in Jacksonville, Florida. But Feld says he and Oswald attended A&P school. A&P is short for Airframe and Power Plant, a mechanic school, quite different from a radar school. This slide shows the discrepancy between Warren Commission records and Feld's statement. Warren Commission records show Oswald attended radar school in March and April 1957 in Jacksonville, but Feld says he and Oswald were in California at that time. Warren Commission records show Oswald attending Advanced Communication School in Biloxi, Mississippi in May and June. Feld says he and Oswald attended A&P School in Jacksonville, Florida in May and June. Warren Commission records show Oswald reporting for duty on July 9th in El Toro, California. Feld says he and Oswald attended Aviation Electronics School in Memphis, Tennessee in July. Warren Commission records tell us Oswald departed for Japan on August 22nd. Feld says he and Oswald were still attending aviation electronics classes in Memphis, Tennessee. Warren Commission records show Oswald en route to Japan by ship until September the 12th. 
Feld says he was with Oswald at that time in Memphis and last saw him in September. Feld was transferred to Opelika, Florida, later a major CIA base, and did not see Oswald again until September and see Oswald again after September 57. Now here's a statement given to the FBI and entered as a Warren Commission exhibit that clearly conflicts with Oswald's official whereabouts in the Marines over a period of at least six months. Yet Feld was not called to testify, nor were his statements to the FBI investigated. Neither the FBI nor the Warren Commission chose to deal with Feld's knowledge of Oswald. If they had, perhaps the truth about Oswald would have been made public 30 years ago. Warren Commission Exhibit 1386 is a statement given to the FBI by Airman Second Class Palmer E. McBride of the U.S. Air Force the day after Kennedy's assassination. McBride's statement is similar to Alan Fell's in that both men had knowledge of Oswald <clears throat> that differed significantly from Warren Commission version of Oswald's life. But whereas Feld had worked with Oswald for a six-month period while in the Marines, McBride had worked with Oswald in New Orleans for nearly a year, but at a time when Oswald was supposed to have been in Japan and the Philippines. Warren Commission records show that Oswald was in the Marines from October 1956 until September 1959. But McBride says he worked with Oswald from the fall of 57 to the summer of 58 at the Pfister or Dental Laboratories in New Orleans. Oswald told McBride, more emphasis should be placed on the space program in view of recent Russian space successes. I wondered if Oswald was referring to Russia's October 1957 launching of Sputnik. In late 1957 or early 1958, McBride took Oswald to his home to listen to classical music perhaps two or three times. In early 1958, Oswald, he took Oswald to a meeting of the New Orleans Amateur Astronomy Association at the home of Walter Gerke. In 1958, McBride visited Oswald at his room at the Hotel Senator, where Oswald showed him copies of Das Kapital and the Communist Manifesto. The Hotel Senator was less than 50 feet from the Pfister Dental Laboratory where McBride and Oswald worked. Both are in the French Quarter in New Orleans. McBride and Oswald had worked together, made deliveries together, and visited each other's homes for nearly a year. The Warren Commission did not take McBride's testimony. In fact, of the eight individuals mentioned in McBride's statement, only one was interviewed by the Warren Commission. That person was William Wolfe, Jr a friend of McBride's who had met Oswald briefly. Wolf's testimony is five pages long, but provides little information about Oswald. Remember, Oswald, remember McBride saying he'd worked with Oswald during 1957 and 58? When Warren Commission Attorney Liebler questioned William Wolf, a friend of McBride's, his opening statement to Wolf was, we want to inquire of you concerning possible knowledge that you have of Lee Harvey Oswald during the time that he lived in New Orleans during the period 1954 to 55. Before we get into that, however, would you please state your full name for the record? A very clever statement by an attorney who knew exactly what he was doing. Before Mr. Wolf could comment on Liebler's statement concerning Oswald in New Orleans in 1954 and 55, Liebler hurriedly asked Wolf to say his full name for the record and did not give Wolf a chance to think about or question Liebler's reference to 1954-55. The only way Liebler, the Warren Commission, or anyone else knew about Wolf was from McBride's statement, Commission Exhibit 1386. That statement says that Oswald was in New Orleans in 57 and 58. But Liebler tells Wolf that he wants to inquire about Oswald in New Orleans during 54 and 55, two years before McBride said Oswald worked at Fister's. Neither Liebler nor the Warren Commission wanted to deal with Wolf or McBride's knowledge of Oswald in New Orleans in 1957 and 58. The next slide summarizes McBride's statement in relation to Warren Commission records relating to Oswald's marine duties. McBride took Oswald to Astronomy Association meetings at the home of Walter Gerke. In a statement to the FBI, Gerke said, quote, none of the meetings of the association were held in his home until 1958. McBride could not have attended a meeting at Gerke's home until at least January of 1958 and not before. 
But in early 1958, according to the Warren Commission, Oswald was in the Philippines. Gerke's statement complements McBride's contention that Oswald had been at Gerke's home in 1958. Neither Gerke nor McBride were interviewed by the Warren Commission, nor is there any indication that the FBI investigated their reference to Oswald in 1957 or 58. There are, however, indications that the FBI deliberately tried to create evidence to show that Oswald was working in New Orleans prior to 1956, rather than in 1957 and 58, as McBride had stated. There are several indications of such cover-up. McBride visited Oswald's home, his room, at the Hotel Senator in 58. Yet the FBI interviewed only those employees of the Hotel Senator who had worked there prior to 1956. That's cover-up. The FBI reviewed hotel registration cards for the year 1956. Right there. Instead of 1957 and 58. This again is cover-up. The FBI avoided 1957 and 58 entirely. Employees who could have remembered Oswald or his mother in 1958 were not questioned. Just as Wolf's testimony had been directed away from 1958 to 54 and 55, so the search for Oswald at the Hotel Senator was directed away from 1958 to prior to 1956. By limiting their search for Oswald to 1956, the FBI again avoided dealing with Oswald in New Orleans. In 1993, I met Linda Faircloth, manager of the Pfister Dental Labs. Linda knew of Oswald's employment from speaking with previous employees and partners of Pfister's. They remembered Oswald and McBride working for Pfister's as messengers. One former partner said the FBI had taken each of the four partners to separate rooms to be questioned. They were told not to discuss Oswald matter among themselves or with anyone. The FBI took employment records, payroll records, canceled checks, employment applications, W-2s, and all records pertaining to Oswald's employment. They never returned a single item. A 1993 Freedom of Information request to the FBI for Fister records yielded nothing. Linda and I telephoned Paul McBride in November 1993 and had a lengthy conversation which we tape recorded and have shared with a number of researchers. McBride reconfirmed his 1963 statement to the FBI and elaborated further. He said he had met Oswald's mother at the Hotel Senator. He remembered he and Oswald sitting with Fister employees, Miss Imelda and Mr. Williamson during lunch breaks. They used to laugh at Oswald when he talked about communism. He and Oswald rode buses or trolleys when delivering dental packages. He insisted he was with Oswald when Sputnik was launched by the Russians on October 4th, 1957. McBride said Oswald's comments regarding recent Russian space successes in fact referred to the 1957 launching of Sputnik. After Oswald quit in July 1958, McBride remembers Pfister receiving a letter from Oswald saying he was working at a shoe store in Fort Worth. Another Pfister employee, Paul Fiorello, also remembered Oswald. Warren Commission Exhibit 2229 is a statement by Fiorello. He told the FBI when Oswald quit Fister's, he said he was going to Texas where he had a job selling shoes. McBride said Oswald had quit Fister's in July of 58. At that time, Oswald was in Japan in the military prison. Jack, let's go to slide 33. We don't have much time left. This Warren Commission document is Dallas Police Report of November 26, 1963, listing items taken from the home of Ruth Payne and turned over to FBI agent Warren DeBreeze the same day. Items 168 and 169 are tax withholding statements. Notice the W-2 showing Oswald worked for the Pfister or Dental Laboratories in 1956. But McBride said Oswald had worked at Pfister's in 57 and 58, not 56. Either McBride's statement or the W-2 form from the Dallas archives was false. The federal tax ID number shown on the W-2 form for Fisters is 444-599. I called the IRS district office in Memphis, Tennessee and asked the IRS representative if it was possible to determine when these tax numbers were issued. Please listen carefully. I was told the tax ID number issued on this January, on this 1956 form was issued in January of 1964. Those W-2 forms are fake. <laughs> C-1 
Since these W-2 forms could not have been created until at least two months after Oswald's death, what happened to the W-2 forms listed on the November 1963 police property receipt? Oswald's tax returns for these years are still classified and withheld from the public. If they showed his employment at the Pfister Dental Labs during 57 and 58, we can understand the true reasons for keeping them secret. I've read the war in volumes. Most of us have heard of Oswald's Russian-speaking ability and his communist tendencies while in the Marines. But how many were you aware that when Oswald was in Japan and the Philippines in 1957 and 58, there is no evidence of his speaking Russian, reading Russian newspapers, listening to Russian records, etc. Only after returning to El Toro, California in December 1958 are there reports of Oswald speaking Russian, subscribing to Russian newspapers, and talking about communism. A month and a half after returning to the States, he takes a Russian test. A few months later in June 1959, he had a date with Rosalind Quinn, who had been studying Russian for over a year with a Berlitz tutor. They conversed in Russian for several hours. She was impressed with his knowledge of conversational Russian. Where did he learn Russian? Where did he have time? While in Russia in 1962, Oswald wrote this letter to Senator John Tower. A copy of that letter was read and studied by the professor of the Slavic Language Department of Yale University. The professor wrote to Senator Tower with his opinion and stated, the person who wrote this letter was a native speaking Russian with an imperfect knowledge of the English language. If the professor is correct that the author of the letter, allegedly Oswald, was a native speaking Russian, Many previously unanswered questions regarding his language capabilities could be explained. The person who filled out his 1959 passport application listed his mother's birth date as July 3, 1909 and his father's birth date as December 1908. Four years later, he filled out another passport application but listed his mother's birth date as 1907. His father's birth date is 1895, 13 years off, and misspelled his mother's maiden name did two different Oswalds fill out these passports? Jack White's conclusion that several of the Oswald photos are composites made up of two different people is now more easily understood. It's obvious that these combined photos to shoot show two different Oswalds. John Pick told the Warren Commission, the Lee Harvey Oswald I met in 1962 was not the same Lee Oswald I had known 10 years previous. Was Pick trying to tell us something? Marguerite Oswald told the Warren Commission, I think he was recruited by the CIA that he was sent by this organization to Russia, then to Dallas to infiltrate subversive organizations, and who knows, to expose a plot against Kennedy. The Warren Commission members gave you their opinions in 1964. We are entitled to our own opinions. From the government's own evidence, we have the strongest case yet for more than one Oswald. And if there were two Lee Harvey Oswalds, then who created them and perhaps manipulated one of the Oswalds into the twisted maze of the Kennedy assassination could help us understand who was really behind the assassination. In conclusion, I hope my presentation has shown that more research is needed in order to understand who Lee Oswald really was and who he represented. Thank you. I'd like to add one quick point. I think this too is a very graphic and outstanding example of how one, I started to say average citizen, I don't know how average he is, but, <laughs> but how one individual, one American citizen taking his own time and his own effort and his own money can dig through there and maybe come up with something. And I hope all of you take that into account. You know, we, we can all get in there and don't think that there's not anything left to find because I think John's found something. And when you put this together, think about it a little bit as you go home this evening. If there were two Oswalds, or three Oswalds, or four or five Oswalds, okay, then this is a government intelligence operation. What a perfect patsy for an assassination because now everybody has to run for cover. Everybody has to cover up. And sometimes for the most benign reasons. Because if there were phony Oswalds out there, how many other phony individuals were out there? How many other operations were they running? 
And then maybe this could rip open this whole thing. So maybe there is legitimate reason to hide away things because of national security. Yeah. Thank you all. Gary, you want to say something? <laughs> All right, he ran just a little bit over, so we're going to just take a 10-minute break. It's worth it, though, wasn't it? All right, 10-minute break.